you must give to your wife as a married man. Space and place. I was watching your man of God when he was brought up to declare this conference open and he made his wife stand beside him. Now listen, beloved. The literate of the 21st century are not the people that cannot read or write. They are the people that cannot unlearn and relearn. So stop saying that behind every successful man is a woman. That is a lie from the pit of hell. It is not scriptural. When God was going to create the woman, he didn't take the bone from behind. He didn't take the bone from the head. He took the bone from the side. I feel it was the left ventricle. So it is beside every successful man, there is a woman. Be Behind a successful man is a stupid woman. What are you doing behind? What are you doing behind? Stand beside the man. Fan him to flame. Encourage his heart. And the man should do the same for the woman. You brought me here to speak on marriage. So let's hit the ground running. is many things to many people. To some people, it is a necessary evil. To some people, it's a formal, formal relationship in which a woman should give birth to children. To some people, it is a servant-master relationship. So some people, it is, let's just do it because everybody is doing it. But we are believers and the Bible rule our lives. Marriage is neither African nor Western. Marriage is biblical. Marriage is a gift of God and a gift from God to humanity. In the African culture, the core African culture, there is nothing called marriage. A woman is only seen. That is if and where she's seen and never heard. That's why a man can marry five wives. A man can marry 19 wives. A man can marry as many as possible. And when he feels like it, he can send any of them out. And I'm so sorry to say it's pathetic that even though some men are born again, tongue-talking, heaven-bound, but they still need deliverance from that aspect of the African culture and mentality where the woman is nothing. And it's a pity that some of them are in ministry. If every time, please come my sister. If every time you and your wife are going and you leave her behind, you need deliverance. You're always in the front. And the woman is running to catch up with you. I don't care how anointed you are. You need help. When last did you open the car door for your wife? When last did you wake up in the middle of the night and you woke your wife up to thank her for bearing with you? Who would have married you 15, 20, 25 years ago with all your idiosyncrasies? When last did you, did you wake your wife up in the dead of the night? Not because you want sex, but to just say, I just want to thank you. You made life simple for me. You made ministry easy for me. I know you're not perfect, but I want to bless you today. When last did you leave a check under the pillow for your wife? Not her birthday, not wedding anniversary, just to thank her. When last did you finish having sex with your wife and you thanked her? Instead of... <sighs> Can I be real? I'm going to quote the scriptures, but I'm not here to stand by pastors that don't know how to handle their wives. All they know is the book of Hebrews to the book of Zephaniah. Mm -mm. Let's be real. You want to be successful in ministry. Maybe you need to add this. A lot of pastors' wives are in pain. 
Because pastors can be polygamists. You are married to the church that Jesus gave you, and you're married to your wife. I remember reading about Young Cho, one of his books. He said one day the Lord said to him, I'm going to take my bride from you because you don't know how to take care of your bride. When you look at the Bible, marriage was founded, quote and unquote, in the book of Genesis. The church was born in the book of Exodus, in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the church was born when Jesus' body was pierced. But in the, in the Old Testament, marriage preceded the church. Please listen to me. A few minutes that I have to spend with you today. I have prayed and I trust God that it will be about destiny. This is the order according to God's counsel. God first. You next. Your family life before the church or the business. Because pastor, you will not sit at, sleep on the altar, all things being equal. If you don't take care of your home, there are pastor's children that don't want to serve their God. Because we do not know how to set these priorities in place. And can I shock you, like my husband will say, don't die for the church. The person that could die for the church already died for the church. If you die for the church, you have only died in vain. And there is nobody that cannot leave your ministry. Don't be deceived. You are not else shall die, else you shall die. Yeah. Sir, we'll be with you forever. We are here to stay. Lie. Tomorrow they will come and tell you they just gained admission to, to Australia. They are leaving. The only person that cannot leave you is your spouse. Even your children will leave. Don't go get married. Recently, I was walking through the, our house, and I said, why did we even build this big house? What were we thinking about Jesus? These children, they are gone. Canada, America, this one. Where are they? That's the truth. And I'm going to show you a, a, an illustration. Very, whether you are a pastor, whether you are married or not, I'm talking to you today. Please, plan for the evening of your life so that you will not be lonely. And as pastors, we need to think because sometimes it can be a thankless job. You kill yourself. You labor. You study. You think it's easy to preach one, for one hour. Did you see how many times your G.O. wiped his face when he was preaching? Just to bless you. Those things, he already knows them. If he doesn't tell us, he's fine. He's doing. We see God in his life. But just to bless us. Did you see the way he was sweating? Scientists have discovered that what he just did for one hour is like you are carrying cement and loading it in the trailer. That's why it is evil for you to dishonor your pastor. It is unkind. Daddy, daddy, where are you? Uh, uh, I'm at the hospital. My daughter is, is dying. Daddy wanted to sleep with mommy. Generator just packs up. Pim, he's running to go and meet you there. You know what I mean by generator? <laughs> and yet, some of you will still abuse the mommy. Some of you will still abuse the pastor. Some of you will still talk against their children. Laboring with their lives. And you'll be abusing them with your fingers or with your mouth. It's evil. It's unfair. Because if he had been working for Shell or Chevron, will he not have access to the things that he has access to? And then you think it's church money. Rubbish. Let's not even go there. So please, set the priorities. These are the five most important things in your life. Number one, God. Number two, you. You are not inferior to anybody. God is the most important. God did not create a world in which he will not be needed. There is a vacuum in the heart of every human being that is God-shaped. Only God can fill it. Therefore, I don't want to assume if you are not yet born again, give your heart to Jesus. And when I'm closing, I'll be privileged to lead you to Calvary today. That's the most important thing that can happen to you. I got born again 44 years ago. 
The only regret I have is I wish I had been born again in my mother's womb. That is when your true life starts. God is the most important. Number two is you. Job chapter number 12 and verse number 3. What you know, I know. I am not inferior to you. Job chapter 13 and verse 2. You can't forget that. Job 12, 3. Job 13, 2. What you know, I know. I am not inferior to you. You are not inferior to anybody. You are primary to you. I'm taking you somewhere. You are primary to you. If you understand that, you will not marry an unbeliever as a believer. If you understand that, you will not go ahead to marry someone that slapped you while you went courtship. If you understand what I'm talking about, you are primary to you. Every other relationship is secondary. Low self-esteem is a sickness. Your background does not mean your back should be on the ground. It doesn't matter how you were born. That's not what is important. Not at all. As the head girl in my secondary school, for two weeks I would not be able to go to school because of less than one dollar. Look at it today. I don't even know how many children I'm sponsoring in school. So the point is when you meet with the Lord Jesus Christ, he turns the ladder around. Don't sacrifice your life on the altar of marriage. It is not marriage that completes anybody. Hear me very well and it is not heresy. If you are an incomplete human being, you will meet and marry an incomplete human being and you will have an incomplete marriage. What is important, more important in marriage is for you to be the right person. Water will always find its level. Don't let any man sleep with you before he marries you. If any man tells you until I sleep with you, I cannot marry you. He say, he say bicycle, wait for your Bentley. I don't care what goes on in the world. When we're newly born again, if the strap of your bra shows, you'll be feeling bad. These days, you see cleavages. You see skirts. You see, this is not how they raised us. And we need to start changing the trajectory of Christianity and light the word switch. Let's begin to be decent in addressing. I'm not giving any excuse for rape. You cannot say you raped me because you saw my cleavage. That's nonsense. You will end up in jail. But I'm talking about integrity, dignity, decency. Nature teaches decency. That's what the book of Corinthians tells us. You are important. It doesn't matter who has said what about you. You are very important. Don't hand over the driver's seat of your life to anybody. Don't use sex as a trap, thinking a man will marry you if you sleep with him. There is no man. There is no man that does not want to be a hunter. If you give it to him on a platter of gold, he will abuse you. Men were created to hunt. Men want to look forward to something. But you go to his house, you must cook, you must wash, you must, because you want him to marry you and you think you are 34. God comes late when he wants to come big. And everything I'm sharing with you as singles, I'll share with singles and then I will move to married and then I'll, I'll take my leave. It's based on Genesis chapter 24. We see the prototype of how you should select your married, marriage partner. So I said five things are important. God is the most important. You are next. Then your family relationship. That's the center of gravity. Hmm. Better don't marry than marry wrongly. I know what I'm talking about. Better live your life as a single person till the Lord Jesus comes than miss it in marriage. Marriage determines a lot. Marriage determines. Forget it. There is no way your geo will have succeeded if he has issues with his marriage. It is the reality. That's how it runs. Better stay single than marry the wrong person. So your family is important. Number four is your career. Your career. And number five, relationships. Each of these is a seminar topic, but I'm not going into them today. I'm sticking to marriage. In Genesis chapter 24, we see the prototype. 
So number one, those of you that are single and you are not yet married, please hear me very well. Marry from your tribe. When I say tribe, I'm not talking about Yoruba or, or um, Nawusa or Igbo. No. If you are born again, take on Corinthians chapter 6 verse 14. If you are born again, the problem of marriage is half solved. Marry from your tribe. Genesis 24, Abraham said to the servants, go back and get a wife for my son. The man said, if the woman, we know, he said, then you are free. But that's where. Go. Do not marry someone that has no body you can report him or her to. Don't marry anybody that tells you, I don't fear nobody. It's a danger on two legs. Don't think we are stupid when we honor people. When I see mommy, I kneel down. Or you see, Baba Yedepo prostrating for his mentors. Don't think we are stupid. That is your break system. Any car that does not have a brake system is prone to accident. Luke chapter number 1, beginning from verse number 26. As soon as Mary understood what she was carrying, she did six major things. She went uphill to Judah, entered Zachariah's house, and saluted Elizabeth. Elizabeth, a, a mentor, a matriarch, who was equally pregnant. Let me just pause to say this. There are three kinds of people you must run away from. Number one, expired mentors. Hmm. Saul wanted to kill David. Let's not go into that. Number two, competitive or jealous colleagues. Number three, parasitic proteges. All they do is name dropping. Expired mentors. They are not comfortable with your rising. You preach a message, they cannot even thank God for you. Mary went to Elizabeth. Everybody needs an Elizabeth. Who is an Elizabeth? Someone that is equally pregnant. Someone that understands ministry like, you know, Daddy Gio was talking about a few minutes ago. Someone that understands ministry. That understands the terrain. One of the reasons we could listen to him and be blessed is because we know that he understands what he's saying. We are in this. So when he gives an example, we know what he's, he was talking about. You need a mentor. I'm not talking of somebody's picture that you will put on your screen in your house. Can I take this, my mentor, that you don't even have access to? Locate someone that is secure, that is equally pregnant, that understands how it feels to have money sickness. Someone you can call and say, my husband just committed adultery. I don't know what to do. And that person will cancel with you, pray with you, and still watch you preach without judging you. I'm not talking about mentors that are tormentors. I'm not talking about mentors that all they need is money from you. I'm not talking about mentors that are not secure. Proverbs chapter 4 and verse number 18. The message translation says, the longer you live, the brighter you will shine. That's the word of the Lord. Mentors that want you to increase. I don't care what anybody has done for me in life. I'm grateful. I'm a worshiper. I'm a grateful person. But there's no honor I will give to any human being on earth, including my spiritual parents, if I have not given it to my husband. Because when I did not believe in myself, he found me to fail. When I didn't know that I could become anything, he possibilitized my mentality. I said to him, even if you cough in church, I will be blessed because you live what you preach. I said, you are the picture of the future I want for my boys. You live what you preach. Some of you forget the people that held your hands when nobody would have touched you with the longest of poles. Now you have arrived. Let me tell you something. Don't tell me you are, you are humble. 
until some things are in your life, like money, wealth, power, position. And you can still kneel down to greet the people you used to kneel down to greet. You can still courtesy. They can still call you and you will run there. Don't tell me you are humble. You say this, there's a man in our church, he's very humble, even though he's poor. What else will he be? What else? When a person like Dr. Lemo shows humility, uh -huh. you know what I'm talking about. When you person like the G.O., you know what I'm talking about. Don't tell me I'm a very humble person. Let's see first to get to the position first. Have access to power and money and wealth. And let's see if we can still call you to order. So please understand this. Mary was the most blessed woman on earth in her time and even now. My soul doth magnify the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has regarded the lowliness of his handmaiden. For behold from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath magnified me. And holy is his name. His mercy is on them that fear him. Through all generations he hath shown strength with his power. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. That was what Mary said. Most blessed. But she still went. She still went. So look for a mentor. And you know one thing about mentoring? It is supposed to be mutually beneficial. Because Elizabeth was pregnant. She was blessed. But up until that time, she was muted. But when Mary came in, the Bible says she praised the Lord with a loud voice. That's what it should be. Your mentee should be a blessing to you. You should be a blessing to your mentee. There are so many people that are blessed but muted. Marriage has muted some people. When they were on campus, they were on fire. Because they got married now. They can't serve God again. I'm sure you heard that I said I got born again in 1978. And since that time, I've been sweeping in church. I mean sweeping. By God's grace, my husband is a bishop. He has founded many churches. But I still go to church to sweep. And I will sweep till Jesus comes. Because it was broom phone I was holding before Jesus gave me a microphone. So why will I leave broom phone? Why? When I travel, I pay someone. To sweep. As he's sweeping, I say, God, you know I'm in um, Canada now. Somebody is sweeping. You know, I paid. They lifted you a little like this. You will leave the choir. Some of you, I love what your Gio said. You were the one that had God to call your husband. In fact, you didn't call. You flashed. You flashed God. Call my husband, Father. Call my husband. Because you want someone to carry your bag. I want to carry your leg. And I want to carry your bum bum. And call you. Our mommy is coming. Do you know there are churches that when the Jew enters, I tell the ushers, if I cannot be free among these people that my husband is pastoring, something is wrong with me. Because if you say this person is a high priest and he cannot be touched, he's a low priest. Thank you. He's a low priest. <laughs> leave, leave. And you have seen it. You too, you want a ministry like that. Where your heart will be like satellite dish. <laughs> and you'll be just walking. Our mama is coming. Our geo is coming. Even when the almighty God comes into church, we don't create <laughs> Do you know that success is more difficult to manage than failure? There are some people that they have prayed, but God is still thinking about lifting them. Because God knows that if he lifts them, he will lose them. Because even the almighty God will be tiptoeing around them. And asking the angel, what did he just say? Oh God. I said, what did he just say? People like us, bushy bad doggers. Oh no, wow, baba. We will not need to ask any angel. 
Because there are two kinds of people at the top. First Samuel chapter 2. He lifted the poor from the dust. And the beggar from the donkey. And made them to sit. Um, how do you know which one? The way they praise God. The way they pray. You will know which one is prince. And which one was lifted. Recently I looked at my mates. And I couldn't find my mates among my mates. If you see me roll on the floor, if you see me kneel down, I know what I'm doing. He, he removed hawking tray from my head and made common wealth to give me a word. And you expect me not to dance and rejoice in his presence? Excuse me, if God does what he has done for me, for you, you will do more. All this psychedelic Christianity, if you know the kind of water I have drunk in my life because of the gospel, you went to a place, sometimes they go to preach during Christmas, to preach on the river. Ten of us died. We didn't go there to do ceremony. We went to preach. So don't think, look, God does not throw up. God lifts up. And he's not a blind promoter. I was in London and somebody said, after I finished preaching, she came and knelt down. Excuse me, ma, the handkerchief you used when you were preaching, they are sweat, give me and pray for me. I gave it to her and said, Father, every trouble I have seen in my life. <laughs> every child. I said, ah, mommy, I said, ah, you said you want the anointing I carry. You said you want the grace. Ah, it will be incomplete. Marry from your tribe. Don't marry just anybody. What you carry is too much. Don't marry a fire extinguisher. Don't let anybody kill you because of marriage. The longer you live, the brighter you should shine. Marriage should not kill your zeal for God. Number two, don't marry a lazy person. At 11 a.m., you cannot be praying in tongues instead of being at work. And tell me you're in full-time ministry. You're going to full-time ministry when the ministry has become so, you are so busy, you cannot compare, combine it with any other thing. I said, God, God called me to start original Four Square International Jesus is Coming Ministries. <laughs> As I stand before you today, my husband and I, we are in full-time ministry and in full-time business. Some of you might have known. That's why we are these, these days. Because I sell. I sell this. I have nail salon. I have hair salon. Unisex. This is for men. This is for women. I have restaurant. I sell pomo. I sell food. As I stand before you, I have small hotel. I have gym. Swimming pool. Without one cobble from church. One cobble from church. If you see my husband when he's on the farm... You will not believe he's a bishop. Harvesting pepper. Our tomato. We were praying this morning for our tomatoes. Time has changed. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 1. Principles do not change, but methods change. God, who at sundry times used to now. Don't marry a lazy person. Let me look at your life. What are you doing? Because after nine months, you cannot go to the supermarket and claim baby milk. Otherwise, Kiri Kiri will claim you. So let me see what you're doing. Marry someone that is mature spiritually, physically, emotionally, financially. You may not be a millionaire or a billionaire, but at least basic needs must be met. As a man, you should be the one paying the school, the school fees, the house rent. You don't need to know how much your wife is sending. I know we talk about common pause and joint accounts and all that. It's fine. You're, every woman was created to look up, wired to look up. You must not be taking offering from your wife. Your wife can help you. Your wife can assist you. But the financial life as a man should not be dependent on your wife. This generation... They're not looking for who they will suffer with. So be a man. 
at least stand. Your emotional life should not be tied to the aprons of your mother. If you are still collecting house rent from your parents, don't go into marriage. Do something with your life. And don't tell me that I'm looking for a job. There is no country where the government can provide all the jobs. Create something. I just told you now that we sell pepper. We sell tomatoes. Come and see our chicken. Come and see pork. Mother will be, his praise point. Mother will say, darling, one pork just gave back to 14 now. Sometimes Sunday morning, he will go to his farm. Quickly, you know, feed whatever and still come to church to preach. This end time, do something with your life. 